group of speakers with us. We'll be hearing from four esteemed panelists here with work ranging from online critique through art to innovation, resistance, and shifts in cultural paradigms. Uh, these are all topics that will relate to Silicon's Valley political, Silicon Valley's political and economic disruption. Uh, if you would like to join the conversation on Twitter, we have the uh, larger conference hashtag, that's hashtag TTW17. Um, or if you would like to be a part of this particular panel's discussion, that's hashtag C2. And for those of you guys who are watching via live stream, hello. Uh, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, please just give us a shout out via the hashtag and let us know and hopefully we can get someone to uh, get on that immediately. Uh, I am Joelle Woodson. I'm the moderator for today. I'm a recent graduate of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, which is a small tech school in upstate New York. Woo! Uh, and I've just recently graduated uh, in sustainability studies and design, innovation, and society. I'm currently a strategic planner at HyperAct. We're a social impact graphic design studio in Gowanus, Brooklyn. Um, so that's enough about me. Let's talk about the panelists really briefly. We have, uh, like I said, four great panelists that are here today. We have up first, Renee Reisman. Renee is a multidisciplinary artist working in curation, writing, and research. She interrogates urbanization, law, and digital humanities through the narratives of erased histories and is also an MFA candidate in critical and curatorial studies at the University of California, Irvine, and the cur curatorial assistant at and or gallery in Pasadena. Renee today will be presenting on the relationship between social media, conceptual art, and institutional critique in a, con in a concept that she coins the minor internet. Up next, we'll have Elizabeth Friedman. Elizabeth serves as the chair of the politics department and is a collaborator with the Latin American Studies Department at the University of San Francisco and is a co-coordinator of the Go Global Women's Rights Forum. Uh, researching through an interdisciplinary lens, Elizabeth will be presenting work from her new book, Interpreting the Internet, where she will give an alternate history of the internet and its applications and explore the ways in which feminist and queer communities in Latin America have engaged with them across struggles with identity, community building, and socio-political impact. Thirdly, we'll have Lior Zalmanson. Lior is a Fulbright visiting scholar and a lecturer at the New York University. He's also the artistic director and founder at PrinceGreenFestival.com. He's also the former research fellow at the Metropolitan Museum's Media Lab, and his presentation today will be on his ongoing work on a paper focusing on how drivers and Uber g guests resist and switch the game and the system with, an ult with the ultimate goal of achieving agency in an algorithmic management system. His work is a collaboration with researchers at Warwick University in the United Kingdom. And last but certainly not least, we'll have Chloe O'Neill. She will be presenting on meme magic and how we can understand memes as, as an as an infrastructure that shifts, that shifts, excuse me, political and cultural politics. Uh, Chloe is a conceptual and video, video artist based here in Brooklyn. So each panelist will have 12 minutes to speak. We'll try our best to stick to that, uh, and we'll open up for questions at the end. Okay, let's get started. This is Renee. Hi, so as you know, I am Renee, um, and I'm an MFA at UC Irvine, and I'm going to talk to you about what I call the minor internet, or non-radical innovations of internet-based art. And my slides got really rasterized for whatever reason, so apologies that these images are going to end up probably being a little blurry. Um, so my way of conceptualizing this is that minor internet is institutional critique for the internet. Um, this was a phrase coined by the performance artist Andrea Frazier, who is known for making gallery works that, while they take place in a museum or, or gallery simultaneously, are kind of like provoking or pointing out the blind spots within these institutions. So she's really known for um, doing performance pieces where she might pose as a curator and all her dialogue will be direct quotes from like other critics reviews and stuff to kind of point out the absurdity of the institution. So um, number point, points one and two are kind of the, the most basic elements and then three and four are a little bit sketchier. Um, so I was, um, 
I summarize the minor internet as exploitation and subversion of online platforms. They are not used as intended, and they expose the blind spots in Silicon Valley technology and culture. So I'm using Silicon Valley here as a bit of a catch-all term. Um, you know, we obviously not everything is made in the Valley, but I'm just using it here to uh, stand in for the culture, the economics, the, the way it works, uh, the developers, like just the whole, what we kind of understand is that big term. Um, when I say to not use them as intended, uh, I think like one example that we can all think of immediately is like Twitter bots. When Twitter first came out, it wasn't branded as this place for like experimentation like that. Um, and even though it's been embraced now, originally Twitter bots were like really weird and, and new and, and like confusing. And it's like, oh, okay, we can use Twitter as like a completely different art form. Uh, the second point, which I think is extremely important, is that minor inner networks are primarily conceptual, even though some of them might be aesthetically driven. So I like to compare this mostly to the work of Michael Asher, who's a Southern California uh, situational aesthetics artist. So what he did, um, he rarely made his own original work. He would, um, like in the Kunsthal in Berlin, or I don't think... I might have the wrong city, but uh, he like exposed the radiator system within the gallery. So took it, the pipes from the walls and put them on the outside. And he did work like that. So kind of thinking along this way, um, minor internet artists don't really create new things. They work within the paradigm of the social media platform or what other service that they want to kind of critique or um, to use for their work. Um, so... Michael Asher's of the internet. And again, it's not formal. Minor internet is not net art or post-internet art, which is more like fine art with the internet as the starting point. Um, I mostly came to this uh, coinage, this term, because I was trying to describe internet works that were not about the aesthetics, not glitchy, not, you know, not quite video art, but also still on the internet and like have to be on the internet in order to exist. So uh, point three is that it's the appearance of human labor. It could be a bot, it could not be. Um, it's kind of tangentially related to performance art, but mostly it's like we understand like there is a person or poses as a person that is creating the work. And then the last thing is that um, I really don't consider this work that radical because in order to do it, you have to use the platforms. And sometimes that even means like spending money on ads to make ads that poke fun of Facebook and so it's kind of like hard to get away from the platforms and to establish like a new realm of making art um, but it doesn't necessarily mean it can't be radical ever and I'll get to that later. So I just want to go through the like academic end of how I thought of this. Um, this is a very oversimplification of toward a minor literature but essentially Deleuze and Guattari were talking about uh, Franz Kafka, a German Jewish writer, writing in Czech in Prague. Um, and their argument is that he deterioralized the major language of Czech. Um, he worked in bureaucracy, and so he commented on the higher institution he worked within. And he was a minority uh, within this majority set structure. So if we look at the internet as today's major language, uh, we look at that majority as the Silicon Valley umbrella term that I'm using, and the subordinates to that power are the users. And so minority in this sense isn't about mass of people or, uh, or identity, it's more about who has power and who doesn't. So that's, we, you can ask me more about this later, but very oversimplified background. So now I'm just going to go through some art examples that I think kind of encapsula encapsulates the minor internet, and I'm going to go um, kind of chronologically. So in 1991, we had Chuck Welch's, uh, Welch's Telenet Link project, which was basically mail art, which is when you would write letters and individually send them to people, uh, but on email. <laughs> and I think this is uh, showing that Basically, as soon as the internet became a consumer product, and probably even beforehand, people have been trying to find ways to experiment with what they had. You know, it's 91, we don't have really social media at all at this point. But he had email and he realized he can reach quite a large number of people and show these like original writings and these collage and these strange little uh, things that he made. And uh, if you guys are familiar with Tiny Letter, um, the like, I think it's SurveyMonkey runs it. 
almost every cool person right now has a tiny louder and I love them. But that's kind of, I feel like, another form of art that's really taking off that's kind of like stemming from email art. Uh, not everything in the MITRE internet is explicitly an art project. Uh, Craigslist in the year 2000 started their best of section, and I think we all kind of have seen at least once in a while a Craigslist ad that is clearly not meant to be selling <laughs> things in classifieds. Uh, probably the most popular are like misconnections that are really like really awesome MFA creative writing, <laughs> uh, probably portfolio pieces. And so this is an older one from 2001 where <laughs> you can get a Mud Hut studio for $600 a month. And it uh, sounds like a really great deal. And uh, you know, it won't wash away when you do the dishes, which is awesome. Uh, so yes, just wanted another like early example of what this could be. Lonely Girl 15, I think, is a really important example because it kind of is a ripple effect for a lot of themes we see in minor internet. This was a project of a woman who had a YouTube channel. It was basically, this is, I think, 2006. So it was very live journal-y. Uh, she, like, exposed her feelings and emotions and, like, talked about boys and all that stuff. And then it turned out that she was an actress and this was not even a real uh, vlog. And so this idea of authenticity and shallowness and how we present ourselves online becomes a really, really big component of this type of work. And you'll see it again and again and through some other examples. But this is one of the earliest that I could think of that caused such a stir because uh, almost everyone thought it was real. And when it was revealed that it wasn't, people were like, oh, like you can, you can be <laughs> on the internet. No one knows your dog, right? So. Um, Aaron Koblen's project on Mechanical Turk, to me, is one of the examples of minor internet not on a social media network. Uh, Mechanical Turk is Amazon's like crowdsourcing. Um, you like pay strangers around the world to do m small tasks for you, and it's really, really cheap. Um, it's basically uh, outsourcing. So in the year 2006, he hired, um, he spent $200, two cents per worker, and get 10,000 pictures of sheep. <laughs> um, and these are drawn by the mechanical torque workers. And I found this project really fascinating. One, because it really puts into perspective the amount of labor and how, uh, how little it costs to do what I would find a massive collection of images. But also it's really exposing like, I mean, each one of these drawings is like very individualized, definitely not robot made or if it is you know clearly not the same robot um and it really humanizes these workers that we don't really see when we use the product and so i think it's just a very interesting example of pointing out how complex mechanical turk is and like you know how are people making a living off of it like i think the average salary was like 50 cents an hour um but yeah lots and lots of sheep <laughs> I love horse ebooks, RIP. This is going back into uh, the example of Twitter, um, at Twitter bots as being one of like the most recognizable minor internet pieces. Horse ebooks, um, I know the history got a little scrambled. So actually, it was a real bot until uh, late 2011. And then it got sold to this person, Jacob Akilka, who turned it into performance art. So it's actually both. It was real bot and then performance bot. Um, and the fact that a lot of people like couldn't tell when it switched is like kind of crazy. And um, some people figured out just by like the where the tweets were sent from. But, uh, you know, so there's another one. Here's one that an artist, uh, Chloe Flores and Carrie Yuri. Um, Chloe Flores had to make a Facebook page and, uh, you know, to participate with society, essentially. And she didn't want to, like, actually have one, so she ended up making it an artist residency. And so every month, a different artist took over her timeline. <laughs> and so basically, Carrie Yuri was one of the more, um, I guess, recent or at least Googleable <laughs> artists in residence on her page. And I just like this idea that if you don't know Chloe very well, anytime you visit her, it'll it'll change. So I'm going to skip ahead. Um, I just want to say this was an aesthetically driven project, but um, again, conceptually about SMS messaging and how we communicate with each other in intimacy. Uh, another piece inspired in the lonely girl vein. And this is when we get to gray area minor internet works where 
Clearly, you're not going on Uber and playing Yacht's music video, LA Plays Itself. It only became able to watch online when Uber was beyond 1.1 surge pricing. So it's kind of this cool concept where you're not they're not doing anything to uber itself but they are definitely putting attention onto the way it works and the surge pricing and how we're kind of like stuck with it at times and so uh this music video came out a couple years ago i think in 2015 and then finally um this was a trolling project i did when i first started thinking about what the minor internet could be and uh, wikipedia is overwhelmingly male i think 90 percent of the editors are male and so i was like what if i make a performance piece so you make the article but actually when people want to delete it you have to argue with them as to why it should stay up and so i uh i acted like a politician and never changed my stance and was like no this is legitimate and um yeah um, and weirdly, on my flight on Virgin America, there's a chat, and so I was like, that's weird. Anyways, um, as we said, it supports it while it critiques it. Um, however, there is a potential for radical thought. Um, Cyber Tweed did this project with the Deep Web Bake Sale. Um, they're a feminist collective that kind of like makes hacker culture like really cute and frilly and pretty. And so they did a bake sale where you could buy cookies in the deep web, which I think is changing how we think of it. And then finally, the Standing Rock Indian Reservation check-in, I think was another activist unexpected, how does this work on Facebook when you can manipulate location services? And, uh, you know, it was unprecedented. And I don't think I've ever seen activism take place in this form. And Regardless of the logic, or uh, unfortunately the problem is still around, it did at the time actually make real change. Um, the pipeline at, was stopped uh, in December, and you know, it's not anymore sadly, but sometimes Facebook slacktivism <laughs> seems to do something. Um, and that's it. And uh, so that was my presentation, and I'm sorry I had to kind of skip ahead at the end there. But um, yeah, if you have any minor internet examples, I would love to see them. And um, thank you so much for hearing me out. Uh, up next, we have Elizabeth. I'm just going to walk over here with my talisman. <laughs> Don't, there's not really room for it here, but um, it very much has to do with what I'll be talking about today. Okay, so I just wanted to start by thanking the Theorizing the Web folks and Joelle for making this uh, possible. This is such an interesting panel. I'm really honored to be part of it. And I'm really looking forward to hearing um, your perceptive questions. Um, this morning has already been so fascinating. So as I may have indicated by sneaking over here with something completely offline, um, what I'm talking about today comes from a much larger project. Um, I spent about 15 years observing Latin American feminist and queer counterpublics and going down to Argentina, Brazil, um, and Mexico several times to talk to activists about how they were engaging with different applications in order to build what I call their counterpublics. So I've just rolled out a pretty piece of jargon there, so let me explain how I use it. Um, you can think about counterpublics as being the fascinating, messy, challenging insides of social movements, right? These are places where marginalized folks who find it difficult to be heard or to make change in wider publics will come together to build their identities, to construct their communities, and of course to articulate strategies for broader change. And what all of these folks taught me was that the original social scientific approach I took you know, professor that I am, to trying to understand how the early internet was having an impact on activism was kind of the wrong way to think about this. And I'm doing my mea culpa here to a group of people who, of course, are very aware of what I'm going to realize here, which is that we have to think not of technology as something coming out of there like a bolt from the blue, like a meteorite and hitting human communities as if it is objectively removed from us, but thinking about society and technology as inherently enmeshed with each other as mutually constituted. So when I went down to talk about sort of 
the dawn of internet time with these activists, already that internet reflected values, was mined by various kinds of social relations of power, and that what I was able to see over time is that as users interacted with various applications, they would transform them through their use. And so because a lot of this work, as you might imagine, was me struggling with constant um, forms of interpretation between English, Spanish, and Portuguese, that idea of interpretation really stuck with me. And what I realized is that these activists were interpreting the internet into their own vernacular to do the kind of work that they were already very busy doing. So I want to share one story of that interpretation with you. And this is the story of a really old application so old that it wasn't called an application when it was first distributed. That is the venerable listserv or distribution list. Has anybody in this room not heard of a listserv? Awesome. Okay, when I, when I, t when I talk at my university to my young students, they're often like, listservs? I have to go to the Google Groups thing. But in any case, okay, so you know how long listservs have been around. Um, so the Women's Information Network of Argentina, known to it friends and fans as RIMA, um, for the Spanish acronym, um, was a listserv started by a group of volunteers um, in the year 2000. It is still the longest lasting national feminist distribution and discussion list in Latin America. Um, and it brought together a really wide, uh, brings together a really wide um, section of the Argentine feminist counterpublic, young and old, activists, academics, workers, lesbians, um, straight folks, um, trans and cisgender, the one thing they all have in common is that they self-identify as both feminist and women. And I'll get back to that gender exclusivity in a moment. Um, and what I realized from talking to, uh, they call themselves either rimeras or colisteras, which really echoes the idea of a comadre, somebody who, with whom you have a very um, close social relationship of support. Um, so by talking to these folks and by reading lots and lots of their posts, I realized that what they were doing on and with this listserv is that they were embodying feminist values through their online practices. Now I've just said the term feminist values and I know all sorts of antennae are going up. What is a feminist value? Can you possibly say that all feminists have the same values? So it's 2017. Please do not quote me as saying all feminists have the same values. Um, the values that I call feminist here are very much derived from my understanding of the feminist value creation within this particular counterpublic or set of counterpublics. And I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to think through what these valued structures were because I not only studied this impact of this meteorite on this pre-existing community, right? But where that pre-existing community came from. Um, and in the Argentine case, it's, uh, you can actually kind of date the development of a lot of the values that currently are quite important to these counterpublics because starting in 1986, um, Women in Argentina who self-identify mostly as feminist have come together in the National Women's Encounter, right? Every year, every couple of years. So this is a F to F experience in which thousands of women come together to talk about issues of common concern. And those issues change radically from year to year. Sometimes it's all about resistance to the neoliberal structural adjustment policies that have periodically rolled over this Latin American country la located very di you know, directly in the global south. Sometimes it has been about resisting ethnic discrimination and then over and over again it's focused on issues such as reproductive choice um, and uh, queer issues. So um, coming out of that experience they've developed these uh, values and what's so fascinating to me is I saw how they enacted their values through their online practices. So I just want to talk about a couple of them and and um, to, to go back to poking fun at myself about what, is there this well, you know one set of values. I think we have to hold at the same time that these are the values that I saw emerging from this community through, through discussion with this community. But of course many of you will see that there are lots of resonances with a lot of sort of alternative counterpublic communities. One of the central values here is autonomy. And autonomy is very important in the Argentine context um, in particular ways. So they wanted to have an autonomous space for their interaction. So it's all volunteer, which means they're not beholden to um, 
sort of fun, you know, whatever a funder would want them to focus on. It's woman only, which again, this is in the Argentine feminist context. Lots of these women have experienced a lot of marginalization in mixed gender contexts, and so they wanted to maintain this space that also reflects um, the uh, demand that they have for their national women's encounters to still be single gender. And then finally, it's nonpartisan, and it's nonpartisan because partisan infighting in Venezuela is fierce and often rends activist active, um, uh, actions. Also want to point to the value of democracy amid diversity, and again, this will be resonant for many people who've looked at counterpublics before. Um, and what you saw um, emerge organically over time is that although this listserv really started out as a distribution list for information, over time the way the members were using it, right, made clear that they wanted to use this space the way they were using the offline encounters to engage with each other, and that's something I'd be happy to talk, um, talk about more. Um, then before I close up, I do, of course, want to tip my hat to social media use. Um, as I mentioned, the distribution continues, but uh, there are also other projects that have gone forward related to REMA on social media in which you can see this enactment of values through online practices. Um, and the, one of the ones that I'm sort of most intrigued by is a blog called Potencia Tortillera. And for those of you who don't speak Spanish, that translates into Dyke Power. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Latin American or particularly Argentine culture, saying Dyke Power is still a very radical thing to do in this particular context. And they, so the founders of these, um, of this particular blog, um, who include some folks from RIMA, intended this blog to be an online curated archive and museum of lesbian feminist activism in their country. And so what did they do? They took the blogger in interface and they transformed it in particular ways that would support what it was they were trying to do, not just online, but for their own community. So y'all know that on blogs, right, there's a, the date, the chronology of when you posted things. So they basically seized that function and they made it start in 1970. Now, we all know there was no blogging going on in 1970, right? I mean, I'm sure there was some kind of things that people would call blogs, but not online blogs. They had to start it back in the early 70s because that's when their history started. That's when the first groups published their manifestos, right? There are pictures that go all the way back. And so if you go through their chronology, what you'll see is this is a chronology of their history. Um, and so there's various kinds of artifacts available through this archive, through this museum, um, whether those are pictures or more recently videos and audio. And they were very clear in terms terms of founding um, this blog, that their, their main reason for, for putting it up there, for having this archive, is not only that they realized that their history was nowhere, right, written nowhere, not at all referenced in any sort of online or offline histories of Argentina, but they thought it was very vital to both preserve that history, and in particular to preserve those documents, Right, at least scan them and put them on some cloud. But also this was important in terms of intergenerational transfer of activist knowledge, right? Because this was a place they said younger activists can go, they can check out what happened before, and we're not saying accept it as this is the way things must be done, but engage with your history. Perhaps your history has some things to teach you or for you to engage with. Um, so the um, Potencia Tortillera, again, um, is an example of how They've really reached in um, to a pre-existing commercialized space um, and really made it their own. So last thing I just want to sort of come back to my main takeaway here is that when we're thinking about disruption, um, and in particular, I mean, I'm sure we could have an interesting discussion about the difference between hacking and disruption. Um, but I think often when we think about how things get disrupted, um, we may think about those in terms of either the physical internet or the logical internet, like we're disrupting the code, we're really transforming it in some base level way. Um, but what I've found, what the activists I've talked to have taught me is that there quite a lot of disruption can go on through user Right, the user interface. Um, and in this case, I feel as though they've really disrupted the intention of these applications by transforming them in ways that can really serve their communities according to their own values so that they can have, you know, sort of a more robust uh, space for their activism. Thanks very much.
you. Thank you, Elizabeth. We have Lior Zalmanson next. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much for this uh, great panel so far and for uh, this very exciting Theorizing the Web. It's only my second time here, but I love this conference. Um, I'm going to speak about um, Uber, that was already mentioned here, and mostly about the resistance of drivers. How many of you have seen this article in the New York Times like five days ago? So some of you have seen, I recommend it. It's a really, it's a, it's really interesting long form piece about psychological tricks, so to speak, mostly behavioral economics that Uber, but not just Uber, all light hailing companies use in order to basically make drivers do whatever they want. And I like this piece, but one thing bothered me, and that was that I think this piece belittles drivers in a way, because they really play them only as like, you know, pawns, you could manipulate that easily. And they just don't give them enough credit that they are like smart individuals who understand what's going on. So I'm going to present some of the dri my, my insights on the driver's side. I've been talking to Uber drivers, not just Uber, Juno, Lyft for the last year or so, and we've been following their forums as well. So before and what they did amazingly in the New York Times is defined the issue that Uber is facing. Basically, it's the issue of driver's independence on the one hand, right? They're they're independent contractors, so basically Uber, so, so to speak, doesn't owe them a lot. But because of that, they are experiencing a lack of control. Like for Uber, business model to succeed, they really need to control drivers in a very, very specific way. So introducing, the result is introducing what now is known as algorithmic management. Interestingly enough, the article that coined it came from human computer interaction discipline. And where well, they called software algo, where well, they called algorithmic management basically software algorithms that assume managerial functions. So it's basically outsourcing that to the algorithm. Let, let the algorithm take care of it, and it's really useful when you need to oversee myriads of workers in an optimized manner at large scale. And there was an article, another one, by uh, Alex Rosenblatt and Luke Stark that talked to drivers and saw how big basically are the information and power asymmetries they face because that system does not give a lot of information to drivers and part of Uber's success in controlling drivers, not just Uber, Lyft as well, is by not revealing everything to them or like choosing strategically what to reveal and when. Um, and last in my introduction is I'm going back to the New York Times piece because I like the fact that they use the word gamification. In many ways, it is now known that the way Uber uses um, or exercises control is sort of similar to the idea of gamification, where there's one of the main uh, basically function, not procedures, I would say, is introducing them to a goal. I know you can see this clearly, but introducing them to a goal and say something like, oh, you're just like a mile away for that goal, or like two customers away, and then kind of like hooking them up in a similar way to how video apps or Netflix are working. So in my research, what I found out is basically I'm recording the tension that occurs uh, between the independent autonomous labor that prides themselves for being flexible in terms of time, for being their own boss, uh, for working in isolation so they don't need sort of to report to anyone. But in the same time, how does it align or what is the tension that rises when it meets the algorithmic management and governance, meaning a technology that has no transparency almost, that has information asymmetry, and where the human drivers in this case cannot really talk to, to other humans. I don't know if you know this, but Uber doesn't have a human um, customer su driver support. It's all via email and mediated communication. So th even if they have something serious, they cannot complain to another human being about this. The result of this tension 
is what um, I phrase, but using sense making, which is from the organizational literature, uh, guessing and sense making this is them. By the way, it was written in the title, but I haven't mentioned this again. This is a, a work I'm doing at NYU with two researchers, Malaika Millman and Ola Enfritsen from Warwick University. So I, I would like to just give them credit where it's due. And basically, when drivers guess and sense make the system, they do it many times through online forums where they get social reinforcement and they create stories and myths together. Sometimes that leads to ex ex exaggerations, sometimes that leads to uncovering the truth, that depends at the case. But the result of the guessing and sense making is that they end up, some of them of course, resisting the system, switching the system, or gaming the system. And I would like to elaborate on that. So, first of all, again, the autonomous worker, Supposedly, and that's what Uber or Lyft claims, drivers are autonomous, right? Because they can stop at any time, they can decide how many hours to work, they can pride themselves in, they do pride themselves in being independent, and this is from my interviews uh, where they said basically that you are your own boss and they don't really envy people who have bosses who tell them where they can have, when they can have bathroom breaks. But there are, there is, um, a role here for the algorithmic management. And I chose here to show you a specific case which is the most interesting is the pool example. Drivers hate Uber pool or Lyft line, everyone. It's amazing, it's almost unanimous. And the reason you could see from their answers, basically when they're in pool, they are less in control. They also earn less, but they don't, they're not sure how much will they earn? They don't know how much the customer will be paying. They're not, sh they're not sure about navigation anymore because Uber, once you're in Uber pool, you are basically coerced to their navigation and they just, it leads to specific routes that sometimes seem incomprehensible. Like sometimes they, they are sent to another neighborhood where they supposedly usually stay in the same neighborhoods or something like that. You can see just by searching Uber pool on Google, most, of the driver just like hate Uber Pool and they like to talk about it. I love this example. First of all, sorry. First of all, Uber Pool, I don't know if you know how drivers used to call it, like to call it, but it's Uber Poo. Uh, there, there's also, sorry, there's also Uber Fool. There's like videos of drivers, the drivers created explaining to other drivers why they are being foolish uh, when they take Uber Pool. So they say, here is some, some driver says, think about how crazy it is. We're driving to a set of destinations in the middle of a crowded city using another app to navigate and suddenly wham, like George Michael, rest in peace, not a sports machine guy, everything changes uh, through the Uber partner app while we drive, forcing us to rearrange everything, including the navigator with one hand still on the wheel. So for them, it's, it's a crazy experience of loss in control and it's not worth it in terms of money as well. So what do they do? So first of all, they try to guess and understand the system. They try in a way as a precursor to outsmarting the system, they try to guess it. So this uh, Lyft driver that I interviewed, basically he couldn't never make it to the goal of I think it was 75 rides or number of rides. And he really thought Lyft is manipulating the goal. And when you're close to it, they will just not give you right. It will take hours and hours. And frankly, I don't know if that's the truth, but it was his truth. And that's what's important. And they go to the forums where they converse, where they make stories. Maybe some of them are truthful. Maybe some of them are exaggerations. It doesn't really matter. And there they can, of course, get social support. But it also uses, it's also in many cases enforces their own bad feelings and make them act, make them resist. So three ways of resistance. One is actual resisting or usually stopping to use the system. For the foreign, them, sometimes the language is very resistant, right? We, the partners, will oppose slavery and will stand for our right until the last one of us. No pool for life, who is with me? So very, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I like this example. My mom would make dinners with olives, but I wouldn't eat the olives. As I grew up, my mother would ask me if I liked olives. After years and years of telling her I will not eat olives, she has stopped her attempt to feed me olives. So this strategy of let's just like resist to Uber Pool by not taking Uber Pool, maybe Uber will understand we don't like Uber Pool, will stop making us do it. And of course, there's like Facebook uh, events and, uh, and basically campaigns that they create in order to resist to together and sort of covering the fact that they cannot be unionized. 
they can also switch the system and the competition really helped them. So you could see for some, some advice somebody gave on an Uber people blog that says drive Uber for one week, June or next, live third and sort of like manipulate the fact that you can get a bonus at each if you're just starting to drive. Of course, if you've been probably using one of these systems, you've saw that your driver has more than one system in place and usually they do strategic switching all the time. For lack of time, I'll move to gaming or tricking back the system. When you're feeling you are gamed all the time, it's basically, it gives you a lot of motivation to game back. Sometimes this could be sort of like, there's raises questions of ethics because it can hurt the passenger side, the other human customers there, like this driver that tells to customers he didn't like for some reason, that he drops them off and ends the trip before and basically clicks on the cancel button before they can rate him with a bad rate. And those are the kind of advices that you can also find in the phone. And there's this interesting app at the, uh, for Android that gives tips to the random Uber driver. For instance, the fact that he should download to his device the customer version of Uber, because there he could see basically a lot of things that Uber doesn't tell or uh, doesn't disclose to the driver's side. Like uh, in this case, the passenger app shows where other Uber drivers are. If you're surrounded by drivers, this strategy can help you get into better locations. So just a few concluding thoughts. First of all, as you know, Uber is like, under a lot of pressure these days. So they define 2017 as the year of the driver. What it will actually mean, it's a mystery. Nobody really knows. Drivers are not sure of that as well. But I'm hoping they will do something. But probably I'm not. I'm not hoping. You know, I'm. I'm up to. Uber thinks about Uber first and foremost. I hope they will think better of drivers as well. One good examples I've seen. A lot of drivers like the Juno app, and one of the reason they like it, other than the fact they take like less commission is that they get shares, they're being partners, real partners in the Juno, and, and that's what they thought is most important, they have real human support. When they encounter a problem, they can talk to an individual who listens to them. And that, I would say, that was the most popular comment from Juno drivers. That's what they were really looking for. So I think this talk, I don't know if it was reassuring or like optimistic, but I think that the optimistic thing we can take from it is in the, in the face of automations, we should give credit to drivers that they will find creative ways as long as we're humans, as long as we're not automated drivers, as in robots in cars, drivers will find a way to use the same technology to regain back control and a sense of agency. Thank you so much. Okay, last but not least, we have Chloe O'Neill. Do you want to try the slide show? Yeah. I don't, I tried to put it into a PowerPoint and it like messed up the format. I mean, I can do it just verbally, but it would be like less effective. Give
verbally. Okay. Um, so I had a presentation for you all, but I guess there is no... Oh, okay, maybe there will be. Um, but I'm just going to get started. <clears throat> okay, so um, my name is Chloe O'Neill. I'm going to be talking about memes um, and thinking of memes firstly... Oh, great. Uh, as an infrastructure, and then a little bit about meme magic, which is kind of a rabbit hole um, topic but then going into how the alt-right used uh, meme magic or claims that it used meme magic to uh, further the election of Donald Trump. So, uh, a meme is an idea, the definition of a meme is an idea that spreads from person to person in a culture. Uh, memes are images that uh, are symbols, or memes are images or symbols that carry an idea or an ideology that exists through uh, an emotional response. Um, so you can think of them as uh, an image that carries um, an emotional reaction, and memes exist on an independent level um, between that image um, and the person who's interacting with it. And through that emotional response, there's kind of a, an idea or an ideology behind um, a certain meme. Memes themselves don't appeal to reality, more often, they appeal to irony uh, and share their content um, through that rather than like kind of logic. And memes are always made in response or opposition to contemporary culture or events, and they're highly adaptable and flexible. Uh, political memes are a little bit different. Um, use the same kind of irony and ideology. Um, couch their uh, political goal in irony. Uh, and use usually negation as a political tool to uh, chip away at the opposing ideology um, or the politics that they're working against. Uh, so I argue that we should think of memes as a cultural symbology or a system of language. Uh, memes work to share ideas subliminally uh, through the creation of cultural symbols um, and in so much that uh, memes also exist in a post-viral internet economy, um, being that it doesn't matter if a meme is uh, becomes viral, so much that we're constantly being exposed to it um, and ingesting it. Um, so in that way that it exists in an independent relation with the viewer, uh, memes don't kind of drop off in the way that uh, a viral image or a viral news article or a listicle would after it becomes viral. Meme magic is a part of that. Uh, you can kind of like divide meme magic into two parts. The first part being chaos magic, uh, which is kind of an old idea that you can make uh, real events happen through the creation of symbols um, and sigils. Uh, through like a will to power or creating a belief system that makes those uh, makes that happen. Um, and then secondly, um, meme magic describes the ability of a meme to sublimate uh, certain ideas or ideology into larger cultural consciousness um, through meaning making, which is a word that I'm using to describe the meme's ability to carry ideas um, as well as instantaneously share those ideas. Um, spread and co-opt um, and redefine certain cultural symbols to mean certain things to certain people. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, so the best way that I think that we can think about memes is as a certain kind of explosion um, or a fireworks show. Going into this explosion are a certain type of identity or cultural politics. Uh, virality or the ability of a meme to become viral and be instantly shared. And then thirdly, an online community that can read a certain meme as um, a type of cultural symbol or make meaning from that meme. So then the meme happens, uh, and then you have meme magic, which as I said, uh, the push for that meme to become shared throughout um, any given culture, um, and then feels. Uh, being the emotive response that you get when you look at a meme, um, which carries 
a certain ideology or an idea. And then thirdly, uh, extremism, um, which is kind of, so if you think of, because memes exist in a post-viral economy and they're existing kind of um, constantly and instantaneously without, t without like a, uh, a sense of time, uh, you could go on your Facebook feed and see like 30 different memes in 10 minutes. Um, and that means that memes, in order to become memorable and stay relevant, there has to be, there is uh, like a push towards extremism. Um, so memes become more and more extreme. Uh, different like groups of memes become more and more extreme and become like, shit posts, uh, which is like a meaningless meme. So in thinking about this um, as like a larger economy, um, there are four different forces that are affecting a meme at any given time. Uh, as he said, the shit post um, being this like push towards extremism uh, and meaninglessness and the kind of like absurdist nihilism. And then uh, the counterforce to that is legibility or the need for a meme to first make sense, um, but also carry ideology. Uh, and then on the other side of that is meme magic or the push for the meme to spread into larger culture. Um, and then also oversaturation being um, the kind of loss of depth perception that we get when we look at too many memes. Um, or uh, when you look at memes for too long, things start to like not make sense. And there's like a sort of overwhelming feeling that you get. So I think that we can map um, or mirror this same kind of uh, the forces that are affecting the meme economy onto the contemporary political uh, field that is existing on the internet today. So on one side you have the alt-right and the alt-left that are using memes um, to build aesthetic and culture and at the same time sharing their political ideas. <coughs> uh, so don't I'm not going to get cool. Okay. Um, so whereas the alt right, ex or sorry, whereas the alt left exists mostly on Facebook, um, working on things like neurodiversity, neurodivergence, gender diversity, um, black self determination, reparations, things like that, the alt right kind of exists on the opposite end, um, working uh, pro mostly primarily around white nationalism, anti semitism, uh, conspiracy theories, and occultism. Um, economic nationalism and Nazism. Uh, the alt-right started on 4chan and 8chan uh, politically incorrect and random boards and this was like very loosely organized in the early late two, in the late 2000s um, and without a real kind of political cause but mostly centered around trolling uh, which is basically just arguing politically by debasing uh, and harassing your opponent. Uh, the first kind of attempt that the alt-right had to work towards a political cause was Gamergate, which happened uh, late 2014, early 2015, um, centering around uh, sexual harassment and really intense like bomb threats um, of online gamers and the manosphere, which is kind of like uh, the online culture of pickup artists on a small group of female um, feminist video game developers. <clears throat> uh, and yeah. So, oh, you can't really see this very well. Um, well, this is a Pepe meme. Um, it looks a little bit different on my computer. Um, but basically the most famous example that you all have probably heard of is Pepe the Frog of um, the way that the alt-right used memes and meme magic um, to uh, accomplish a political cause, being, uh, in this case, the election of Donald Trump. So um, basically, Pepe the Frog started in 2005 as an illustration, um, which kind of became like a very popular internet meme in 2012, 2013. Um, and on message boards, 4chan and 8chan, uh, so there's like a number of like synchronicities that happened here. Uh, people would say kek, um, which is means LOL um, on, on these message boards. 
uh, and s eventually someone connected Kek, which is the Egyptian god of chaos, to um, Pepe the frog, because the Egyptian god of chaos, Kek, is a man with a frog head. So there's this kind of like revolutionary meme, um, and of course, the alt-right lends itself to conspiracy theories. Uh, so people had started to get this idea that Kek was the god of chaos magic, um, and he was, uh, Pepe the frog was a reincarnation of Kek, kind of coming back to help the alt-right um, use chaos magic. And yeah, so basically what happened is, almost at the same time of this, um, the alt-right picked up Donald Trump and decided um, to push for his candidacy on the internet and also uh, kind of use similar organizing tactic tactics that they used uh, on Gamergate to harass and troll and, um, you know, make a lot of noise on the internet in order to debase uh, liberal, other kind of like left um, movements towards Hillary and activism around Hillary on the internet. Um, and at, around the, at the same time, uh, Hillary started talking publicly about the alt-right and Pepe the Frog, uh, naming uh, Pepe the Frog as a hate symbol. Um, and at the same time, the, the ADL did as well, uh, kind of, <clears throat> which kind of gave it, naming it, gave it a lot more power. Um, also, September 11th of last year, Hillary like fainted in New York um, right at the same time as she started talking about Pepe the Frog. And this was kind of like a point of galvanization <laughs> Um, for the for the alt right, um, and this continued not just with Pepe the Frog, but with a number of other memes. Um, I'm kind of not intentionally, or I'm intentionally not showing you these memes because um, you can like easily Google them yourself. Um, with the point being, this also looks weird, but um, so the alt right kind of solidified in a in a really visible way um, by joining up um, with people on message boards with like. Um, public individuals, and of course with Donald Trump famously tweeting an image of himself as Pepe the Frog, um, is kind of like the biggest part of that. Um, yeah, and, of, and whether or not um, me magic was at play here, it doesn't really matter. Um, I think the fact that, that Donald Trump won on the presidency kind of gives power to the chaos magic that was at play here, and as well as gives us an idea um, of how of how memes are used in contemporary culture. So, kind of like concluding thoughts, what I hope that you all can get from this is that um, thinking of memes in new ways um, in order to work against uh, the alt right and um, uh, basically um, how to better use memes and how do you better organize on the internet um, and understand um, how memes work on the inter internet in order to um, work with them on the left. Cool. Thank you guys, that was great. Uh, we have about 15 minutes for questions uh, and how we'll do this, we'll have you guys, if there's a question from the audience that's for one of them specifically, we'll have you guys come up and repeat the question just so that those on the live stream can hear it. Uh, and please, no lengthy statements. We would like to keep this with you guys ending with a question and keep it rolling. All right, go ahead. So the question is for Chloe. Let's get a great presentation. What is the difference between oversaturation memes and cognitive dissonance? Is there a difference in your research between those two? What do you mean by cognitive dissonance? Or do you hear the same information over and over again and you disassociate the meaning of the word with the meaning of the, the word with the meaning behind it? Is there a difference between the um, between like shit posts and oversaturation. Oversaturation and cognitive dissonance, where you hear the same word over and over again and loses its meaning. No, I mean I think it's I think it's the same. I think that okay. the point of oversaturation is that it exists more broadly, and I'm thinking in terms of images and aesthetics. Um, just like not, it's not necessarily like seeing the same meme over again. It's seeing um, just seeing like so many memes, you kind of get it's a feeling of like being overwhelmed um, by internet content in terms of. Yeah, which kind of exists, um, which is what I mean by like post virality. Yeah, my 
question is for Renee. Um, so I definitely, I, I thought it was interesting that you distinguish between like conceptual versus formal with the minor internet. Um, and so I was wondering about the relationship between, or if, if there is one, between the minor internet and the traditional art establishment. In other words, is there a line between what's, you know, what's trolling or what, because like things like, like horse ebooks or like Lonely Girl 15, most people wouldn't think of that as art. So is there a line? Uh, should there be a line? And you know, where, where would we draw that line? Yeah, well, I think it's pretty ambiguous, to be honest. Um, I had to wrap up a little bit quickly, but I do argue that a lot of pieces that maybe aren't explicitly stated as art can still be seen as art projects. Um, you know, it's debatable as if the creator themselves would say that, and they would probably maybe argue that it's not. But I think um, art in general, we have such a wide breadth of what it can and can't be. Um, as far as like trolling versus minor internet works, um, again, it can be both simultaneously and it can be neither. Um, I think you had some very genuine projects here, such as like Chloe Flores' uh, Facebook residency, which some people did consider it a little bit of a troll because she was using Facebook to not really be herself. But at the same time, she was like, this is a very legitimate place on the internet that a residency can exist. So, um, yeah, all the, all the spaces are very gray, and I think that's okay. Um, and I guess the only time where it would matter is that if the artist is speaking for themselves or the non-artist is speaking for themselves, I think that, you know, you respect what they say that the project is if, if for whatever reason they make a statement on it. Uh, so my question is for Chloe uh, regarding the meme magic. Um, part of what makes a meme, I guess, viral, uh, but the point of that is that it's somewhat humorous and people don't really take it seriously, they just laugh it off. Um, and coincidentally, Donald Trump as a character in society and popular culture kind of had that same sort of character, right? Where people didn't really take him seriously, but he was kind of serious because he's a billionaire, but he's still like this reality TV sh uh, star, and he wasn't like a serious billionaire businessman person in society. So how much do you think of like the idea of me magic is tied to the persona of like a Donald Trump versus like, <laughs> could me magic, could that have worked for like an Obama where... Um. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. Um, yeah, I think that, um, there is like a, a real importance in irony and, um, for memes to not be logical. I think the second that they represent like an establishment or the second that they represent a kind of logicness, logicalness, they, uh, they lose a certain character. Um, so the, the, like the special part of political memes is that they aren't logical, but instead they appeal to certain kinds of like emotional reactions, um, being like white supremacy, things like that, that, um, that people who are interacting with those images um, are eliciting. Um, you spoke mostly about her and other people driving on the services, but from my understanding, the end game is loose the driver. If the cars are around themselves. So, what degree does your framework work on the other kinds of like, uh, I don't know what the term is, but uh, uh, labor that's uh, uh, flexible. Not, um, yeah. yeah, flexible. I know that. Yeah, sure. Uh, the question was basically if I can generalize the claims that I made to more than just Uber, the Uber business model, but maybe to the broader gig economy or labor on demand sort of thing. Um, I think we need to theoretically separate between the gig economy and, and, and algorithmic management uh, or crowdsourcing. Because like, if you look at a business model like Fiverr, uh, then there's a lot of critique about that as well. But at least the communication seems like a two-way sort of thing. And the negotiation is still very much up to the human. The algorithm, like you approach a seller like on a Fiverr and then basically you negotiate the fee. There are problems also with that business models. But I think ride hailing or... Um, yeah, ride hailing is the is the is the best example for something that is being, as you said, kind of like prepared to the age of automation. I think we are all like in this mid 
sort of like in the between days in which this is like maybe just like a segue solution um, to, to an age where, where humans will, will not be needed and that's why they are being mistreated as such. I, I don't think I can then generalize it to gig economy broadly. Um, there is a lot of papers on Amazon Mechanical Turk because they are also, they are not getting a voice in many cases, you know, policies are being enforced on them. Um, but still, I think ride hailing is just like the, the most, I would say, yeah, extreme example of like algorithms in charge. Uh, this is a question for Renee. Um, are there certain platforms that lend themselves more to the kind of minor internet art? Or are there certain qualities of the platform that make that art easier to produce? Yeah, I mean, I think social media platforms overwhelmingly are the most applicable. Um, and I think it's just a matter of accessibility. Unless you're an artist that is familiar with like programming or um, or you're using a service similar to Mechanical Turk where the audience is really just yourself, you know, those are... I don't think they're harder to use. They're just probably less common because you don't have the everyday interaction with them. Whereas, especially with Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I think those three, more than anything, have become like really the major place where you see it. But I've also seen projects on Tinder. <laughs> um, I've seen projects on Snapchat. I've seen Wikipedia and another one. Um, uh, like I had to gloss over Miranda July Somebody app, but like creating an entire app of your own to like make a work it's it's different degrees but i think the major social media platforms are like you know that's kind of like the sweet spot right now but i i'm really excited to see um it move on to platforms or even not even social media just like i don't know internet things <laughs> I'm, I'm like blanking but yeah i'm just excited to see how it spreads beyond that at some point In this country, we've seen a lot of people who perhaps thought of themselves in the public now being part of the counter public for the recent election. And I'm wondering if you could comment on um, whether you see similar tactics of this user level disruption also happening here, or see any sort of mapping to this country. Can you repeat the question? Absolutely. So the question is whether some of the things that I've found in terms of user disruption of particular applications. Um, are things that I'm seeing in terms of the way that counter-public organizing is going on in the United States. Um, but I really liked how you started by saying that there are people who perhaps thought of themselves as part of the public who are now feeling like they have to sort of in a way maybe retreat or regroup in counter-publics. Um, and I think because, you know, uh, Chloe laid it out so beautifully, if you have this political spectrum um, in which one part of the political spectrum is domina dominating institutionally, and not just at the national level, right? We're very aware of what's going on at the state level as well. Then what happens to the other end of the spectrum? And I think probably, um, I, I really like how Chloe sort of put out there, you know, those memes came from somewhere and they came from, I'm sure, you know, some, some are one-offs, but some of them were deep in Fortran or 8tran. Um, and sort of, so, so you saw that emerge into public space from you know, an alt-right counter-public. And so I think similar things are going on in terms of alt-left counter-publics. Um, again, I think counter-publics tend to, to emerge when people feel like I cannot be heard or seen or do the kind of work that I want to do. Um, and uh, so what, what's interesting to me, though, is I don't think it's actually new on the left. It's particularly not new for feminists on the left, and I think there have been allusions to that on, on this uh, panel and the other p two panels I was at this morning, which is that the Internet is, you know, the public Internet is a, it's just not a friendly place for people who self-identify as being non-male heterosexuals, right? And there's all sorts of vi violence that's, you know, sort of psychic violence and up to physical violence that's thrown at folks through that. So I, so I actually think that there are lots of different examples in which people have sort of um, retreated into digital spaces um, to try to do their work. And that goes back to this question about sort of which platforms are the best platforms for that. What I find fascinating is at the sort of at the international level, very much coming out of the global south, there's a whole movement about how to keep yourself, your, yourself and your activism safe online, including really specific kinds of technical um, uh, 
if you will, disruptions that you can do on your phone in these sort of um, less well-known social media spaces in order to do that kind of work. So. I'm just going to say we have about five minutes left. If you're on Twitter, please feel free to ask a question. That's hashtag C2. So, Elizabeth, I guess the question is... Um, Piggybacking off that, in the countries that you've studied, is there a sense of institutional memory beyond sort of the histories? I, I think sort of like invisible. Is there a teaching platform that teaches them the disruption that works within a given society? So how did they explain that within the, the systems they use? Yeah, that's such a great, um, such a great question. And I think right now, indivisible is something. Again, what's fascinating is indivisible move from the right to the left. I mean, I think the left sort of. The right mimicked the left very successfully and got themselves into office, and now the left is sort of mimicking, you know, so there's, so there's sort of the strategies that are going back and forth. Um, and, and I think your question really goes to the, to the idea about um, how do people learn how to do this, and whether there are sort of deliberate teaching platforms or, or teaching mechanisms. And in the book, I actually have a chapter on the ways that both sort of more general left-leaning techies developed internet strategies, um, particularly to reach between the global north and the global south. Um, but then a group of women within this sort of broader, it's the um, uh, Association for Progressive Communications, for those of you historians out there, um, or people who've been around for a while. Um, and so there was a group of feminists within the APC that said, how are we going to figure out how to have appropriate technology for women that they can use in these ways that they can build their counterpublics? And so there's so many examples, um, but I think the more important thing here is the story of this transmission um, that comes out of an experience for folks who have been embedded in counterpublics for so long that when new technology comes along, they're thinking very critically about it and then seeing how to do it, how to do that transfer, um, keeping their values intact, if you will. So it's, it's pretty much it's common knowledge that um, autonomous vehicles are going to be a commonplace thing, and the drivers, I'm pretty sure, are well aware of this, right? I'm just wondering in terms of like, are they taking this threat seriously? Do they see this as something that's like this existential threat that's going to come and destroy all their jobs? Are they preparing for a different type of job? Or are they like organizing together to like unionize against Uber and Lyft? Or is this something that they're like, this is 20, 30, 40 years away? So first of all, most of the people I've interviewed seen this as a temporary job. So most Uber drivers do not believe they will want to keep this job five years from now. So I would say most of them are not at all worried because they think they will be in another place. Some of them are former yellow cab drivers, and f with them I did see some concern. And they, are, they have a lot of more also place to um, compare the working conditions. And I think those people are much more active. This is, this is not a not tested hypothesis, but it's interesting for the future. I think those people kind of behave a bit differently over these forums because they are used to a different work environment. They are used to more sh knowledge sharing with their peers. But most Uber drivers, uh, the large majority, just don't believe they want to be an Uber driver three or four years from now. I'm wondering why this idea of the minor internet has to be separated, or why you make this move to separate it from net art mm -hmm. and the history of net art, which is, in my opinion, like actually I'm teaching this to my students who are like maybe around here, mm -hmm. um, like has this history of culture jamming and misusing platforms and kind of misrepresenting. Um, yeah, why why make that pull away? I really kind of uh, came down to categorization and um, clarity. It was um, mostly from my personal experience of trying to explain types of projects that I was interested in and like a constant need to be like, it's not about how it looks. It's not about making it appear different. And there's a lot of like questions of like, how does conceptual art work and where where is the space for it? And so it's like, can it even be online because the internet is such a visual platform? And so I think I was trying to explore like, yeah, can we have works that are conceptual that 
exists in spaces that we purely think is visual, more or less. And so I don't, I think there's also a lot of commonality between minor internet and net art. There's definitely projects that you could say are both because they are super aesthetic, but also very like supported by the concept or the theory behind it. Um, so I don't think the distinction needs to be very sharp, but I do think it should be there um, just as a way of <laughs> making it easier <laughs> to describe or to clarify. Or if a per if an artist is thinking about working online and they're like, I don't know how to I don't know how to call this art because there's no space for it and people won't see it as such. It's like now there is becoming a a platform or a voice for this type of art that maybe has already it's like probably existed since the beginning, but it was really hard to pin down. So. Um, thank you for everyone for coming. Uh, if you guys have any more questions, I'm, I hope you guys can find them after and uh, shoot it their way. But thank you so much. Have a great day.